I've linked that to that you must have faith in your technique and your technique has to be automatic. That means an awful lot of practice. If you come to Dahab and you're doing one deep dive per day, which is absurd if you, if, unless you're having rest days and a lot of them, yeah, I mean if you're in the 70 to 80 meter range or more, um, that's all you can do. And you've probably been wrestling with a lot of things on the way. And whether you're capable of observing, of uh, absorbing all the lessons from a single dive, I doubt it. You need a lot, a lot of dives that simulate diving at those depths until that thing becomes automatic. We can forget about it. We moved it over to the subconscious. We moved it over to the automatic pilot. And the only way you can do that safely and effectively is by doing a lot of empty lung work. After that, to allow uh, concentration, the next stage in our training is, of course, uh, doing head down variable weights. Just taking uh, a weight on the end of a rope and dropping with it. Uh, that way we don't have weights on the body at all, we only have weights in the hand. Uh, coming up is an absolute piece of cake, it's a cinch. Uh, because we've got a buoyant suit where we've got no weights on us at all and we can tootle up, uh, the ascent is really easy. Um, and that way we can put, once we've got used to the idea that we're out of control, Oh, yeah, you are out of control. No, you're not out of control. Uh, you will be dropping a lot faster towards the end than a meter of the second. But if you can still equalize, if your equalization technique is good enough and quick enough, yeah, that shouldn't deter you in the least. And then you find that the whole thing becomes very easy. You can, in one way, divide the ascent and the descent. And you can play with this a little because later on, if you want to make it more difficult, you can start taking off weight in the hand and putting it on your neck. So that you're actually coming up with a certain amount of weight till you get pretty close to the weights that you'd be using in competition. And then you've more or less simulated three quarters of the dive and you've learned all that you can learn about equalization for your constant weight dives. Okay, sounds easy. There are physically background things that we have to do. Stretching, which I'll come back to. Very important part of the thing. If we're not flexible, um, we're going to tense up a lot sooner and we're going to lose our equalization. Uh, the more flexible we are, uh, the less RV we've got, the less residual volume we've got. And uh, this is basically dependent on two exercises uh, that we use. Let me come back to that for a second. Let me go back again to stress and the mental. We are beginning to build between us now a conversation where we're beginning to understand that the first, if you like it, antidote to stress is confidence and confidence in our training. If we haven't got confidence in our training, for instance, if we do a deep dive and it doesn't go quite right, boom, the confidence begins to go down. If it's a disaster, it goes down hugely. So, in other words, we have to be all the way, seamlessly, uh, building a situation where we're not destroying our own confidence in ourselves. So that means everything that we do has to work. 
so we can experiment a lot. Uh, what I mean by that is, I don't mean that every dive has to be successful. I mean every empty lung dive that you have to do, that you do has to be a learning experience that we've understood something. If we've understood it, we are 50% on the way to finding a solution for it. Uh, so it's a question of doing a lot. Um, I do, even at my advanced age, uh, between five to eight empty lung dives uh, every session. up to every session that we do. And uh, they can be, uh, probably the first dive won't be deeper than, let's say, 13 meters. And I mean really empty. And the last dives will probably be in the area somewhere between 17 and 20 meters. Um, if I've been doing this for several weeks, they will pass the 20 meter mark by quite a lot. And we needn't go into that one. But uh, it's just to give an illustration here that it's not uh, only the great champions who can attempt these exercises, you can. And if you want to dive deep, this is what you have to be doing. You have to add in flexibility to the thing, you have to add in the idea of confidence in what you're doing. And that means inuring yourself to all the things that might disturb you. Stress can begin on the surface. Um, training with some French years ago uh, uh, was an eye-opener. Uh, the French had a thing in those days about um, preparing people for competition that they, like me, didn't like the spoilt diver. Uh, they were a little bit more brutal than I am. The French are a brutal race. I mean, you know, <laughs> you've got to accept that. Um, I'm a kind old man. Uh, <coughs> I used to limit people to the amount of ventilation that I did, that they did, sorry. Because I used to see, uh, first of all, there's no physical reason for it. Physically, yeah, you can completely reoxygenate on a single breath, single huge breath, and certainly with packing, if you're doing that, uh, which is arguable. But however, um, so why are we doing? two minutes ventilation, five minutes ventilation, or whatever the hell it is, to get us into the zone. Uh, you have got divers who uh, ventilate for five minutes, and if a butterfly lands on the water 20 meters away, they are disturbed and have to give up on it. Um, the French went to some ridiculous lengths uh, to convince divers that they uh, uh, didn't need uh, to be that spoiled. You should be able to get into the zone and click out of the zone instantaneously. If you're doing exercises dry, you should be able to get up, answer the telephone, and click back in again the moment you finished your conversation. In the water, they would play all sorts of nasty tricks on a diver uh, who was ventilating. Hey, did you see that? Hey, you've got a crack in your fin. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's okay, I mean, I won't get into the real story there. Um, Anyway, uh, they would interfere with people hugely while they were attempting to concentrate and ventilate. And the idea was being not to be spoiled. 
think I've said this story before, but uh, it's a wonderful thing being old because you forget what you said. So you can tell it again and again, and people do go to sleep, but never mind. In the uh, competition in Sardinia in 2001, I saw a beautiful demonstration of this, when Claude Chapuis uh, sat in the competition zone on the edge of the pool, and uh, there was a countdown going down on, which was his countdown, and he was chatting to somebody. And uh, the judges were calling, hey, hey, Claude, Claude, this is your countdown. And he said, ah, oui. And uh, he took three breaths, packed, and then held his breath for six and a half minutes. Um, it wasn't any accident. It was Claude making a point, I think. Or at least I've always taken it that way. Claude has a marvelous sense of humor, amongst other things. And... Um, He's also a superb teacher. So, uh, yes, at least to me, the message came over very, very well. You've got to condition yourself that conditions will not always be perfect. You will not always be diving in the blue hole in Dahab or in the blue hole in the Bahamas. Uh, there will be sea conditions. There will be thermoclines. Hello? Does that ring any bells with people who are in Kalamata who turned early? Yeah? There's a thermocline down there. There was always in Greece where we were about 15 degrees, summer or winter, at 50 meters. Hello? Yes. And it does get dark. Unlike Dahab or I don't know about the Bahamas. The Bahamas has got more varying conditions. And I've never been there, so I'm not going to shoot my mouth off about it. Certainly Daha by now. And uh, Elat, for that matter. Where you've got very good visibility at depth, you've got a lot of light at depth, and uh, uh, no dramatic thermoclines. All these things um, are not necessarily something that somebody can conquer in... Uh, Ten minutes. Kalamata was a brilliant uh, demonstration that uh, most people didn't have enough training in situ. Yeah, uh, to be able to manage that. Um, English team don't have any excuses at all. They've got a lovely little warm pool up in North Wales called Dorothea, uh, where they can sunbathe and uh, dive uh, to reasonable depths and uh, get used to minor cold up there, I believe. Um, what is it, four degrees down there? Anyway, uh, that's it. The main thing that you have to take into account is try and train yourself to uh, withstand the unexpected. That means every training session is a mental challenge to you. Try to train yourself so that you're not the spoiled diver. Try to train yourself that your favorite piece of equipment just isn't available right now. So you're going to have to do it in something else. Uh, manage. Train yourself to manage the unexpected. If you behave like a robot in your training, and you've always got your favorite suit and your favorite goggles and your favorite this and your favorite that, yeah, uh, you're in for a lot of surprises, my friend. So, uh, the training has to be to train yourself to deal with the unexpected. Now, one of the other things is this. This is the last thing I'm going to say, but I wanted to talk about um, static training, but I'm not going to get very much... Um, I haven't left very much time for that. I've tried to fill in uh, the gaps in... Uh, what uh, we talked about last time. I'm going to talk very briefly about stretching. 
and I recommended two things. One was Udayana, and uh, there is a link. Uh, if you look at Freedivers Nauli, uh, which we'll put up for you on YouTube, you'll find uh, Maria Teresa uh, doing a superb uh, demonstration of both Nauli and Udayana. The Udayana that is relevant to freedivers is uh, she demonstrates first Nauli, uh, which is actually more advanced, and which is circulating the ridge in the tummy. And then she takes another breath and demonstrates Udayana, which is just an, a massive lifting of the diaphragm, and then doing flicks, which is pushing the tummy out while still holding the breath and bringing it back up again. Now, the other thing that we do, because that's all for lifting the diaphragm and, if you like it, shrinking the uh, RV, the other thing that we do for expanding and giving more flexibility the other way to the rib cage is the ball. The ball is a 10-inch, uh, in America I think it's called a bender ball. Uh, it's a 10-inch exercise ball, inflatable. Uh, you can blow it up with your mouth. Uh, that's the size of my hand, so you can see what we're looking at here. We lie down on a yoga mat, put this under the uh, thoracic cage, our heads touch the floor at the back and our arms are straight out in a cruciform fashion. And we lift up the breath into the chest as much as we can without lifting our shoulders as we breathe. We bring the air up into the chest, hugely. Now, after about 10 breaths like this, we relax, come up, because also your neck can get pretty stressed like that if you're not used to it. Yeah, Alina will tell you, she got herself a nice crick in the neck by overdoing it yesterday. I want to fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, cost us half a tube of Voltaren to deal with it. Anyway, um, cat didn't like the smell either. Um, so then the next thing is in that exercise, lying back down there on the ball with our head on the ground and our hands here holding just under the ribs. Yeah, We do an Udayana and help with our fingertips lifting the rib cage even more and uh, gently you don't forget you've got a heart in that vicinity and you don't want to put too much pressure on that but lifting helping massaging that to make it softer and make it rise up higher so udayana on your back after the total exhale uh, Udayana standing up as MT demonstrates in the uh, video that we constructed. We will be making a uh, YouTube video before too long uh, when we can find somebody who looks more aesthetic than me uh, on the ball. Uh, to give you an idea, I hope we can you will be able to see this. Just, can you manage this? Uh, before, before I will demonstrate the drawing, uh, Aaron showed you how it looks as opposed to hand, and we have two different hands, I want to be precise and show you that it's 70 centimeters, uh, more or less, so that's the ball. Okay. Um, I was trying to draw something. Here's Alina's drawings. That I hope that uh, will help to understand how you do it. Um, the, the girl, girl sitting yeah. cross-legged is just to show the size of a ball, uh, and you can see the girl lying down. That's the arching. It shouldn't be under the sternum. No, it shouldn't be under the abdomen. Okay. Right. Now you can very small movements of the ball. Yeah, more towards the base of the sternum or up towards the neck will give you a pressure point, different small pressure points on different areas of the spine. And do experiment with that. That helps create 
look, an awful lot of people have terrific flexibility in the lower part of the back, particularly men have incredibly poor flexibility in the upper half of the back. This helps you to develop it and this is where we need it guys. So unless you're doing some really intense yoga yeah, or Pilates uh, for a home cure if you like it, a home exercise, uh, these exercise balls uh, are very cheap uh, we sell them for, what is it, $10,000 each? No, uh, we don't sell them, I'm sorry. Um, they're easily obtainable anywhere. Uh, you can get them from the internet, you can probably get them from your local uh, store that, that stocks uh, exercise equipment. Uh, we have one that's available that's in original package. package. Yeah. And... Um, they're not expensive. So with a yoga mat and everything else you can make huge progress in that direction. That's the best I can do for you at the moment without making a whole YouTube uh, video on the subject. Uh, okay, let's go to the other thing that will lead into maybe a few minutes of talk about static. Um, when we train breath hold exercises for depth uh, we train in a very different way than if we were training for a pool event. First of all, most people for pool events are packing like hell. I am not convinced that this is the way of the future. Uh, I would be saddened to think that it would be, uh, because an awful lot of people are exposed to a high level of risk because they haven't got the patience and they haven't got the knowledge and they haven't got the guidance to be able to do this gradually enough to allow their bodies to adapt to a very high levels of uh, overinflation uh, and there have been a number of very very serious accidents uh, it is not worth your while yeah, for the sake of a few more meters, uh, giving yourself a pneumothorax. Sorry guys, that equation doesn't work. Uh, we do not recommend under any circumstance, I want to repeat this and make this 100% clear, uh, stretching on a packed lung. There are other stretches, including the ball stretches, which achieve the results without any risk to your lungs. It's a terribly simple exercise. You'd be amazed at what it can do. I got very amazed by something years and years ago. Uh, MT and I took a job dry diving on a submarine, which is a different story. I'll tell you at a different time. But what we were doing is we were diving on a uh, tourist submarine. A depth from it was going down. The submarine was going down from 30 to between 30 and 60 meters. We were going down with bifins and we were doing tricks in front of the window to amuse kids. On one side, the submarine was going along a reef and it had lights on it, so there were beautiful colors and tropical fish and corals and everything else on one side. On the other side, ah, a blank window, a window in which the people had been sold, they would see uh, sharks, whales and uh, giant uh, pelagic fish. Actually, all they saw for 45 minutes was a blank window. So when they got a lot of unhappy happy customers, they paid people to go down first on scuba to perform for these people. Well, um, anyway, they had a little bit of trouble with this because uh, there weren't that many dive instructors who liked to dive alone to those depths on scuba. So we said, screw it, we'll take it. Well, I mean, this is an ideal training exercise for us. We'll take it, but we'll do it free. So we did. Anyway, one of the stupid things that I found that amused the kids in the window was when you bent backwards, grabbed your fins from behind, yeah, and did backward somersaults. Well, we'd been doing this for a few weeks, and then I did uh, a yoga exercise. Uh, 
depends where you, what school you come from. It can be called Chakrasana, or it could be called Urdva, Urdva Danyarasana. It's uh, the full back bend. Um, and I had always found this very difficult. And suddenly, whoop, there had been a huge improvement on it. So I worked out that what had happened was it was very, very easy you know, to get this kind of uh, flexibility when uh, you weren't having to fight gravity, which you are when you're pushing up, you know, from your, sorry, when you're pushing up, <laughs> elbows together, from your, uh, from the floor with your hands and your feet. Uh, yes, uh, at that stage the Pilates, the giant Pilates ball had not been invented. It's probably a damn good substitute for it. We have found that more specifically for the areas that we want, that the little ball is very effective and maybe even more effective because it's more precise in, in where we want it to be than the bigger Pilates ball. Okay. Now let me go on to breath hold training for depth. This is very unlike pool training because if we work it out, a lot of your uh, voyage into the depths is actually on empty lungs. Anything much over 30 or 40 meters is on empty lungs. So, hey guys, why are we basically putting the emphasis on full lung uh, breath holds and even full lung breath holds with packing? Now look, your system works like this. Uh, if you've got a lot of available air in the lungs, yeah, where diffusion works beautifully because of uh, pressure falls, um, then uh, why should it, it work hard to scavenge air, transport it better, and utilize it better, oxygen? So if you like it, we have two systems. One is the immediately available system, which is what you've got in your lungs. And the other, I'm doing this in, in almost poetic terms, I'm not being too scientific here. The other is, if you like it, your scavenging system. You could go into which is what in, in detail, but I haven't got time for that right at the moment. Enough emphasis on training full lung, and particularly packed full lung training, dry or wet, is not going to help you for very long on your deep dive. What's going to really help you is how efficient your scavenging system is. Because that is what's going to be the thing that counts. Not only that, hear this. This is the important part. If you can get used to holding your breath on empty lungs, it's rather like holding your, your breath at depth. And your body associates it, if you've been practicing that way, with a familiar sensation that doesn't frighten it. Nice. That doesn't frighten, let's use the, it doesn't frighten it. Uh, right, Alina's produced I a very nice demonstration. I found another demonstra photo of uh, our ex-student, which I miss very much, Emma. Mm -hmm. Doing Here. exercises on the ball. Yeah? That's what it is. Okay? Okay, let me go on. If you've been, if you've been practicing, uh, at the moment what we're doing is we're doing 50%, 50%. I'm doing 50% uh, breath walk. I mean, this is winter training. Breath, breath walk and static. 50% uh, on full lungs, 50% on empty lungs. I sort of alternate them. And uh, here again, I bring in all the elements, trying to reduce the number of warm-ups, trying to reduce the amount of ventilation, uh, not packing. And if you've got a big emphasis on empty lung training, 
you are better prepared for your depth because your body recognizes, hey, this is a sensation I already know. Ah, yeah, and it doesn't immediately tense up. It gets familiar with it. So it's a question of balancing your tra training. Now, this is a very individual thing. This is where a trainer comes in. Uh, this is probably my last words. I've got two more minutes to finish this. Otherwise, we may lose the uh, first hour of this thing, which would be the whole thing. Um, here's the name of the game. Somebody suggested to me that I put out training plans for people. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a great idea. Yeah, because all of us are individuals. And what's stopping one person uh, doesn't work for another. And the more I see of people, the more I understand exactly how individual we are and how, uh, look, uh, a, trainer, a trainer's main job is his ability to assess and to constantly be able to analyze what is not working as perfectly as it should be here how he can improve this. You can have uh, three people doing the same exercise. Each of them in that thing have different challenges. They have different things stopping them from doing it perfectly. Uh, your trainer, his job yeah, is to spot what's not going right for you and to help you, together with you and your consent, to formulate a plan to cross that bridge. I have seen people who have done, uh, if we have an ideal scenario, an ideal plan, an ideal style, an ideal training plan, I've seen people who have made an absolute dog's dinner of that, but have superb results. So sometimes the trainer has to look in the other direction. Say, okay, why is this working for this guy better than the ideal? And not try and force the ideal on that guy. And sometimes it means taking the hard road as well. And saying, hey, uh, that really is you, you could do a lot better than that if you, if you did this, this, and this. And giving it a try. So sometimes it's a question of experimentation. All of us who are not world champions, who do not have sponsors, who will demand that we do another world record this year, have the privilege of experimenting. And that's a tremendous privilege. And that's what is going to make the champions of the future because they can dare to take a path off course that a champion can't because he has to build on the success of the last one. Okay, uh, I didn't fully get into my whole stride about uh, training for static. There's a lot of people who are going to be going into static competitions in the winter and so I'm going to postpone uh, that subject and uh, uh, in the next webinar we'll be chatting about that. I would really love your feedback and your questions uh, and your criticisms and I'd love to hear from the points you don't agree with me. Uh, those are the things I learned from and I hope I've never stopped learning and one thing I will say I'm terribly grateful to all my students because they've taught me more than all the champions put together. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's a parting thought. I uh, hope I see you again uh, in two weeks' time. When does that take us? Uh, the 15th. 16th. 16th. Okay, this is getting pretty close to the time that I go to Mexico. I go to Mexico on the 20th. 
uh, until the um, 19th of November, 20th of November, and in Baja California, I will be doing, and you can see it on my website, deep water uh, training clinics, clinics particularly devised for equalization problems, recovery problems, everything to do with real deep diving. Uh, I will also be doing an instructor's course and a four-star course, but uh, a lot of emphasis will be on the clinics, and I've already got a couple of people that I'm training for that. Uh, they're ladies. Uh, so please, um, if you're interested in that, examine the uh, possibility of it. Uh, the conditions in Baja are absolutely superb for it. We've got uh, the best conditions that I can think of for training, all the training around deep free diving. We've got a marvelous hill for hill repeats. We've got a marvelous Olympic pool uh, with a, a four meter dive pit for doing, beginning to understand our equalization techniques. We've got it, uh, our own boat there uh, and the boat costs are factored into the price. We can do very, very cheap accommodation there. And so if anybody's interested in coming to Baja during that period, please let me know. Uh, you're not limited to the uh, proposed five days. It can be for more than that if you need it. Uh, we guarantee absolutely individual attention. It's not just rote and a big class. We will not accept more than three people at a time. Okay, uh, that's it for tonight. I uh, just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to this. Uh, as I say, I'd be very grateful for your uh, feedback, comments, questions, uh, criticisms, anything else you'd like to throw. Uh, so uh, I want to wish you uh, safe diving and really enjoy it. Enjoy the training. Think about every second that you're underwater. Attention is the whole key to it. Yeah? Bring your whole attention to every second you're underwater and you will progress. You'll become your own trainer. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.